Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Oh, I got one on the front row that said good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you? It is so good to see you here in the house of the Lord on this brisk morning. Uh, I told the first service that they are welcome to take their jackets off and stay for a while and worship with us and praise the Lord in both uh, our song and in the Word today. So who's ready to take their jackets off? Everybody? Oh, no, no, no. Well, okay. Well, you just keep your jackets on this morning. So if you're a visitor here with us today, uh, I just want to say uh, welcome to you. We have uh, visitor cards. If you could fill out one of those, tell us a little bit of information about yourself. We'd like to uh, get you some information about us here at uh, Liberty Baptist. But also, if you notice in your proclaimer, we also have a QR code that you can take your phone, you can scan it, and then you can put all your information on that, and uh, we will uh, get it that way as well. So, I want to say job well done to all those that participated in the Joy Story last weekend. How many of you came to see that? They did a wonderful job with that, right? Yes, the children were wonderful. And listen, if you missed it, if you missed it, guess what? We have it online. You can go back and you can watch it again. It is a blessing to your heart. So if you didn't get a chance to kick off the Christmas season with last week's uh, pageant, then guess what? This weekend, we have Heaven Has Come. Some of you may have come to watch it last night, but we have another presentation of Heaven Has Come uh, celebrating the Savior tonight here in the Ministry Center at 7 p.m. Look, you can come... It's going to be an amazing, amazing worship time where you get a chance to see so many talented individuals just praise the Lord right here on this uh, stage. Next week, you can come and enjoy Handel's Messiah. The Appomattox Community Choral will perform Handel's Messiah under the direction of Mark Landry on December the 18th. And the program will begin at 7.30 p.m., in the sanctuary. Lots of things for us to do here at Liberty. Churchwide Christmas caroling is going to take place uh, on December the 19th at 4 p.m. We are going to meet in the Parsonage parking lot. If you have never participated in Christmas caroling, you don't know the blessing that you are missing. Look, it doesn't matter if you can sing. Look, even I participate in caroling. I can't sing, all right? And, but you know what? I am blessed for it, and you will never know the blessings that you give to others that hear you lift the Lord's name on high. So if you want to participate in that, come join us. Christmas Eve candlelight services, are going, there's going to be two of them on December the 24th. One's going to be held at the 4.30 p.m. service, and that's going to be in the sanctuary. The second one will be held at 6 p.m. here in the ministry center. Bring your families to this Christmas Eve candlelight service. There is just nothing like it. You know, coming on Christmas Eve, worshiping our Savior, the entire reason that we even put these events together right in Christmas is to celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's birth. That's an awesome thing. That is an awesome thing that he came for us. And to share that with your family, I can't think of a, a better uh, thing to do with our time than to praise the Lord with our family. So our Lottie Moon Christmas card post office closes today. So if you've got something that you need to put in there, today is the day. Go ahead and take care of that. Don't forget about that. Uh, and you can put those right in the baskets in the back of the ministry center here. The WMU Pearl Mitchell Circle Meeting is going to take place on Tuesday, December the 14th at 12 p.m. Um, and they're going to have their Christmas luncheon at El Cazador's. And like I said, they have lots of Mexican hats and things. You can dance and eat chips and do all kinds of things for Christmas and have a great time together, a great time of fellowship. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time. And, you know, please bring, bring, be sure to bring your angel gifts for the health care center. Now, one that's not in your proclaimer, uh, and this has to deal with this evening, the Ministry of Compassion um, uh, is looking for a moving team for, and volunteers for the, for the moving team for tonight between 5 to 6 p.m., and that's tonight. They're trying to move, do a move 
a local move, <clears throat> and they're asking if you would help participate in it. If you can, they're asking to meet in the uh, Parsonage parking lot at 5 p.m., or you can contact Ed McCann to see in other ways that you can help with this local move. And finally, this coming Wednesday night, our uh, youth are going to have their youth Christmas party. Look, parents, bring your youth out. We're going to have a great time. The entire family is invited. This is a family event. We're going to have a great time of fellowship, praising the Lord, and just uh, closing out this year. Now, with that said, uh, I'll ask you all to stand, and we're going to worship the Lord in song today. Well, good morning, church. I hope you're glad to be in the house of the Lord. I know that I am. And this morning, we're going to lift up the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Join the angels that first proclaimed his birth, singing glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. We want that message to ring clear from this place, and we hope you'll come back and join us as we continue that celebration. Let's sing out this praise. This angel. Sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be, which inspire your heavenly song? Singing go. and Lord of Lords, the one who reigns over all, the one who took on flesh, became one of us, humbled himself, and yet rules and reigns over all creation. We lift up your name. Crown him with many crowns, the king who left his throne. Creator of the universe, born to the world he holds, and with that 
first drawn breath the word has become flesh Emmanuel has come to around him all the earth crowned by the angel of that night that he was born in a world of darkness. We live in a world of darkness today, but in that world, he has brought light and we worship him. Hopes 
hopes and fears of other years are met in thee tonight. Oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. there in the spirit of worship, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you that you have left heaven and come to earth to identify with us and to reveal to us who you are. God, we're so thankful that you have expressed to us a love and a grace that we do not deserve, but you have so freely given it to us. God, even though the Christmas story is familiar, God, we pray that it will forever be fresh. God, that we'll never give over the fact that you've loved us with a deep and abiding love. God, I pray for the person today who's not a Christian, who has never received the love of God found in the person of Jesus. God, I pray today that they would open their heart and they would receive the humble Jesus into their life. God, we pray for those who are in need today, for those who are hurting, for those who are struggling. God, we're thankful that you are a God who understands our struggle and understands our need. And God, we thank you that you meet us right there and you lift us up and you give us hope. God, today I lift up Christy and Jackson. And God, we pray that you would surround them with your love and your care, especially grace for Jackson and grace for Christy. God, that you would just help them walk through this journey of grief and that you would give them a peace and a joy that's greater than their situation. God, we long for the day where the God who came at Christmas comes again. God, we long for a day where there's no more sickness and no more death and no more struggle. And God, we're thankful that that is our hope. And on this Christmas season, as we celebrate your first coming, we long for your second coming. And our hearts cry, even so come, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Go tell it on the mountain The one that we've been waiting for 
the King of our salvation. Born on this day, our Savior Christ the Lord. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, that we can be The weight of all our sin he came to bear. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, King Jesus, the Savior of the world is born. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, King Jesus, the Savior. Tell it on the mountain Humbly in a manger lay Mercy sent from heaven Angels fill the sky with highest praise Emmanuel, God with us Emmanuel, King Jesus, the Savior of virgin birth, the ruler of all nations, the glory of our God has come to earth. Emmanuel, God with us, Emmanuel, King Jesus, the Savior of to be with you the Sunday before Christmas Sunday, so time is moving on, and we hope you're enjoying every minute of it. Don't let the busyness steal your joy. Stick with it. Enjoy what is happening, because the season will soon be over, and some of you will be saying, how is Christmas over this soon? So tonight at 7 o'clock, Right here in the Ministry Center, we have Heaven Has Come. We had, uh, uh, we had it last night, and then we have it now tonight at 7 o'clock. And for those of you watching, we'll, we will stream it, but it's better in person. So you can watch it on the other end of a camera, but it's always better when you are here. And then, that's this Sunday night, Saturday night, same week. Uh, in the sanctuary, 7.30, Handel's Messiah. So the way I say it, you get the best of the 21st century and the 17th century here at Liberty, all in the scope of seven days. Well, the message of Christmas is God has made himself known in a fresh way. One of the things I want to communicate is while the Christmas story is familiar, the message of Christmas must remain fresh in our hearts and minds. It is a tragedy if you have heard the Christmas story too often that the message is no longer revolutionary. God revealing himself to humanity. We can know who God is. We can be reconciled to God through the person of Jesus, the grace of God, the love of God demonstrated to us is a message that should never get old, even though familiar, 
should be fresh. And so I am not in my limited time telling the whole Christmas story. What I'm attempting to do in the three brief Sundays that I've had in the month of December to not tell the story, but to communicate the message. The symbols of Christianity are also familiar to us. Probably the most familiar symbol is the symbol of a cross. This is a strange symbol indeed. And so oftentimes these symbols that are strange have become familiar. Well, the symbol of Christmas is a nativity. You're used to it, but it's strange. A child in a cow trough, at least from my line of work, if I find a, cow, a, a child in a cow trough, I call social services. I make a report. I run an intervention. That's what I do. But that's the image of Christmas. The image of Christmas is so strange. If I told you that the image of Christmas is a teenage girl who has become pregnant out of wedlock and had a baby in insufficient conditions, so she went to the local barn and put her baby in a trough, you would say, what a strange story indeed. That is the story of Christmas. I'm afraid that that strangeness is often lost on us. And if God wants to reveal himself in such strange ways, what is he saying to us? Well, one thing he has to be saying to us, one thing that he has to be revealing to us, are you ready for this? is not his strength, but his willingness to be weak. The nativity is a scene of weakness. It is a scene of vulnerability. It is a scene of the marginalized being even further marginalized by having no room even at the local homeless shelter. And God says, this is the story I want to tell. This is the revelation I want to give. And may I say, God at Christmas has come to identify with us in our weakness. The essence of humanity is not our strength, but our frailty. Any of us, any of us, are one doctor's appointment, one phone call, one event from being brought to our knees. Our world can come crashing down around us in a matter of moments. We can think everything is going along just fine and then the bottom falls out. Just think even recently, people in Kentucky were planning Christmas just like you. One tornado. The bottom fell out. We are weak people. We are fragile people. And God says, at Christmas, I come to identify with you right there. The writer of Hebrews actually delivers not the story, but this message as clear as anywhere in the New Testament. So God has come close. Why? The big idea today is to sympathize and to empathize and to identify with us in our weakness. This is a major message of Christmas. If you have a Bible, Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16, also look at Hebrews 5, 7 through 9, where we will see how God at Christmas has come to us in our weakness to sympathize with us right there. The first big point, God has come close by experiencing the struggles we face and is able to sympathize with us. Verse 14 of Hebrews 4 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9, further communicates the humanity of Jesus, the weakness of Jesus. Verse 7 says, during his earthly life, he, that is Jesus, offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Though a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. To understand Christmas, we must see Jesus from multiple perspectives. The nativity gives us multiple perspectives. Two gospels tell us the Christmas story, Matthew and Luke. Matthew tells us about the majesty of Jesus at Christmas. Wise men, magi from the east, these opaque figures. We don't really know who they are. We really don't know where they're from. We know one thing, they evidently got money because when they come to Jesus, they lay expensive gifts before him. Clearly, Matthew is trying to tell us the, the, in the weakness of Jesus, there is a hidden majesty, and those afar, even the wealthy barons of the world, will ultimately pay homage to the true king. But in Luke, we get a totally different perspective. We get a ragtag group of shepherds, uh, and honestly, the shepherds are a blue-collar group or lower, and here we get a very unlikely group, the maintenance men, show up at the cow trough to worship God. It is a strange scene indeed, but clearly the idea of the shepherds at the manger is the idea that God has come to identify with those who are low. God has come to identify with those who are humble. God has come to say there is no one in any place that is not accessible to me. Some points that need to be thought through to really get the message of Christmas is Jesus allowed himself to be weak. You know, the most common human experience is frailty, weakness, vulnerability. And sometimes when we think about God, God in creation, God in his law, the picture of God starts going up and up and up and up and we start going, well, I don't know how to relate to that. I don't know how to get there. I don't know how I'm going to achieve those ideals, but Jesus allowed himself to become weak. You say, why? Because he knew we couldn't come to him. So he came to us. The writer of Hebrews picks up this Old Testament picture of priest. A priest is someone who is a reconciler, someone who takes humanity and attempts to place them in right relationship with God. The writer of Hebrews says Jesus is the ultimate reconciler. He's the ultimate one who is God, who has come to reconcile us back to God. And so the writer of Hebrews says Jesus as the great reconciler has not just done some rituals. No, it says, for we do not have a high, a high priest uh, the high priest has passed through the heavens. He's really got the job done. But then, this one who is so high and holy, he's able to sympathize with us in our weakness. When you think of God, do you think of him as accessible? As someone who is able to identify with you in your frailty. Sometimes it's that particular part of ourselves we like to hide. And it's precisely that particular point of ourselves that God has come to disclose. You know, not only did Jesus allow himself to be weak at Christmas, Jesus allowed himself to be identified with the weak. I mean, sometimes we just forget the strangeness of this story. The prophet Micah says, 
We just sang, oh, little town of Bethlehem. I mean, even in that line, oh, little town, you know, maybe we ought to update the Christmas carols, oh, pathetic town of Bethlehem. You know, that's more. Oh, run down town of Bethlehem. Oh, backwoods town of Bethlehem. Oh, obscure off the main road town of Bethlehem. That's the way it was thought about. The prophet Micah says, oh, you Bethlehem, Ephrata, you are the least <laughs> of the tribes of Judah. Sorry. Then guess what he says? But out of you, one will rise. God allowed, to, God allowed himself to be born in a humble place. He allowed himself to be celebrated by humble people. You know, I, I'll never forget this. I do still, I'm still going to the Holy Land, God willing, in May. But there's a place in Bethlehem. You know, you got to go to Bethlehem, you go to the Holy Land. So I went to Bethlehem and there was this little place in Bethlehem called the Shepherd's Fields. And there was a little chapel. And so you go into the chapel, you got to sing Christmas carols. I mean, for goodness, you're in Bethlehem. Uh, And so we sang Christmas carols and then we walked out of this little chapel. And since they're still around, I'm not going to use their names. But one person from the group. Because outside of this, it's still shepherds. You know, some things don't change after 2,000 years. The piece of ground that was good for sheep 2,000 years ago, still good now, you know, doesn't, doesn't change. And so one of the people in the tour group goes, oh, look at the shepherds, you know, and it's the real shepherds. <laughs> and I can, <laughs> you know, the shepherds are like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like the shepherds were like Larry. <laughs> Joe, you know, we're just out here making minimum wage. You know, we're looking for a better job. And, you know, the people in the church, ah, look at the shepherds, take a picture of the shepherds. And they're kind of like, we're just the maintenance men. Leave us alone. Don't look at us. You know, crazy Christian tourists, move along. You know, we forget this. Why do you think that? Because God has not just identified with the lowly, he's lifted them. You'd never think that way about shepherds, if Jesus didn't say, we want you there on the big nights. You know, Jesus raised in a modest community. I mean, even in the gospels, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, it's, it's, it's a backwoods place. You know, he's born to a teenage girl uh, out of wedlock. What was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. Well, then God gave Jesus an earthly father. Oh, he must have a PhD in rabbinical law. Nope, he was a construction worker. Joseph the carpenter. Sorry for the translation. It's technon in Greek. I don't like to use Greek words, but it means construction worker. Uh, And and we can almost tell you exactly the way it was. Herod Antipas, uh, one of the the sons of Herod the Great, decided to make his... uh, big house in a little community about six miles from Nazareth called Sephoris. We can almost historically reconstruct this perfectly. Jesus and Joseph would get up in the morning. He'd say, get your tools, boy. We're going, we going to town to lay, to lay block. Quite frankly, I mean, there isn't a lot of wood in Israel, so they probably wouldn't a woodworker. He was probably a stone man, you know, because if you go into Israel, they made a lot of stuff out of stone. That was Jesus. He put on, his, put on his blue shirt with the white tag, Jesus. And Joseph put on his blue shirt, white tag, Joseph. And we'd go into town and lay block. That's what he did up until he was 30. That's what you call identifying with the average guy. He did that on purpose, by the way. He then went to the Sea of Galilee, not the University of Jerusalem, and said... We got some bass fishermen around here. Actually, the the Sea of Galilee is tilapia, unfortunately. Um, He says, I'll take you guys. And then he found one guy in Capernaum named Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. He was a tax collector. He says, I'll take you too. So he identified with humble people. And then, by the way, throughout the entire ministry of Jesus, what was he known for? He eats with tax collectors and sinners. What's he doing that for? Not only did Jesus become weak, He allowed himself to be identified with those who are weak. If you think Jesus is too high and holy for you, you obviously don't know about Christmas because Christmas tells a whole different story. May I say that Jesus walked the road of weakness? 
but he is not a fellow failure. He is one who has overcome. He has come to where we are to identify with us where we are. But if we would come to him, we would not have to be where we are. You know, Jesus is God and Jesus is man. He's the God-man. He's 100% God and 100% human. That's the orthodox teaching of Jesus. has been for 2,000 years. But Jesus reveals to us what really living is as a human. You know, one of the things that Jesus proves to us is sinning is not essential to being a human. We think, well, you know, just humans, a bunch of sinners. No. Jesus was a human. He didn't sin. He was tempted in every way, but the writer of Hebrews says, yet without sin. Did you know this? Sin is not normal to being human. It's an aberration to your humanity. And Jesus has been right there where you are. He's felt everything you are. He's seen the thrills of, of sin, but he didn't submit to them. You know, some people ask me, which shows us how fouled up our understanding is. Uh, they, they say, you know, Rusty, when I get to heaven, I can't be free because I won't be free to sin. And I said, man, you don't understand freedom. I said, freedom is not freedom to sin. Real freedom is freedom from sin. Finally, I won't be tangled up in this mess anymore. I'll be finally liberated from it. I'll actually be able to express my full humanity without the degenerating effects of sin. Jesus has already modeled all of that for us. He says, man, I've been where you are. I've experienced what you've experienced, but I've overcome it. I've blazed the trail. I'm the great pioneer. And you can follow me if you want to follow me into life. You know, Jesus identified with the weak. You say, what? All right, I'm kind of confused here. A baby in a box, a God in a manger, what's going on here? Why is Jesus identifying with the weak? Oh, here's an answer. Because only those who realize their weakness need a Savior. You know, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, well, I have not come to call the righteous, Actually, Jesus says, I didn't come to call the self-righteous. Self-righteous don't need me, but he says, I've come to call sinners to repentance. That's who I'm. He said, the sick don't need a doctor. Uh, I mean, the sick do need a doctor. The well don't need a doctor. The sick do. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Did you know this? None of us want to be weak. We cover up weakness. That's the way this goes. Or some of us wallow in weakness. You know, it's different personalities. Oh, we got all kinds. God help us, right? Some of us wallow in weakness and Jesus says, I've been there, overcome it. Some of us try to cover up our weakness and Jesus says, stop that. You're weak. You need me to be strong. By the way, the person who doesn't realize their weakness, are you ready for this? Especially you watching. Don't realize your weakness. You're the weakest of us all. The person who's starting to feel pretty good about themselves, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm moving on up. I'm doing okay. I'm about to become somebody. Oh yeah, you're about to become somebody. Probably a fool. Because Jesus says, the one who knows he's weak might actually be in a strong position. There's a famous German theologian who was drafted into the German army and committed all types of atrocities as a German soldier until he was captured in battle. And he was captured by the Americans and put in a prisoner of war camp. And he began to realize all the horrible things that he had done. He started to realize that. Overcome by guilt, there in the prisoner of war camp, he, he, he wished that he would have died rather than to face the person that he had become. 
And while he was there in the prisoner of war camp, an American chaplain gave him a New Testament and said, I know I am your captor, but there's a God who is willing to meet you. As he read the New Testament there in his prisoner of war camp, he's now an old man, but he was confronted by what he said was a crucified God. A God who identified with the oppressed, but also died for the oppressor. And he said, sitting there reading the New Testament, thinking about his horrible atrocities, he realized that God had come for the ones who had been oppressed and the ones who had done the oppression. He said, he didn't find God he said, God found him. He wrote these words. He says, God allows himself to be humiliated and crucified in the Son in order to free the oppressors and the oppressed from oppression and to open up to them the situation of free, sympathetic humanity. He says, God does not become a religion so that man participates in him by corresponding religious thoughts and feelings. God does not become a law so that man participates in him through obedience to a law. God does not become an ideal so that man achieves community with him through constant striving. He humbles himself and takes upon himself the eternal death of the godless and the God forsaken so that all the godless and God forsaken can experience communion with him. God has come close and he has drawn close for every person. You know, I hope you feel about God the way a particular man felt about me. All my illustrations are old, so I'm never talking about you. But there was a phone call, a strange phone call. I noticed the number on my cell phone, and I thought to myself, why is this person calling me? I picked up the phone, a crackling voice on the other end, said, I'm having some struggles. I need you to come now. I said, okay, sure. And I remember going to his home, sitting there in his living room, and I just said, you know, before you tell me what's going on, I just got a question. Why'd you call me? I started listing several other people that I felt would be more qualified to talk to than me. I'll never forget what he said. He says, you know, I thought about calling all those other people. He says, but I know you. I know your life. I know what's happened to you. I've watched you. He says, if I tell you what I'm about to tell you, I called you for one simple reason. You can understand what I'm talking about. I said, okay, then talk away. I hope you feel like, I hope you feel about God in that way. God knows what you're going through. You say, you don't understand this grief I'm in. Obviously, you've not read the Gospels where Jesus' best, best friend, Lazarus, dies. And the shortest verse in the English Bible, Jesus wept. You say, I don't understand, you don't understand the, the, the betrayal I've been going through. Then obviously you haven't read the Gospels where one of Jesus' inner circle, Judas, betrays him unto death. Unto death. You haven't been betrayed unto death, you're still here. You say, you, you don't understand how, you know, society is oppressing me. <laughs> well, evidently you haven't read the Gospels. Because Jesus is put to death by Pontius Pilate. If you think God doesn't know what you're going through, then obviously you don't know the God of Christmas. Because he says, I absolutely do. You know, this strange idea. You say, I don't understand why Jesus would identify with us in weakness. 
And here is a, a concept that you don't need to hear and forget. You ready for this? Jesus reveals himself to us in weakness to tell us something about power. Now, this is a concept you need to, this one might be above our pay grade. Jesus reveals to himself in weakness to tell us something very important about power. You know what we think? We think if I am powerful, I can take a life. Jesus says, is real power being able to take a life or laying down a life? Which one's real power? Jesus says real power looks like this. Laying down a life. Actually, it takes more power to identify with those who are low than to mingle with those who are high. There are plenty weak people who are way up here. And there are many people full of power who say, you know what, I don't need that. I'll go way down there. This is the upside down kingdom of Jesus. When Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, yeah, he means it. He's saying, you people don't think the way I think. You guys don't do business the way I do business. I'm going to have to come and show you how to do all of this. Because you think power is taking life, but power is laying down a life. You think power is, is going up to the who's who. And he's saying, no, no, no. Real power is maybe being the who's who and going down to the who's that. There's real power. You want to follow me, then you're going to have to walk this path. Well, there's a lot to be said there, but I want to make one more big point. The weakness of Jesus allows accessibility. And here's my second and final point. God has come close by offering us access to enter his presence and receive mercy and grace in our moment of need. Verse 16 of Hebrews 4, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. The old translation said, in our hour of need. I like that way of saying it. I don't know how you think of God's throne room, but usually when we get a picture of God's throne room, it's a whole lot of lightning and thundering and deep voices and stay away lest you die. That's the throne room of God if you read anything in the Old Testament. I mean, when, when God comes down on the top of Mount Sinai, you know, the people are like, Ooh, you know, I'm, I'm not going there. Moses, you can go. I'm, we're not going. That's too much. The throne room of God is a terrifying place. That's what you should think. But because God has revealed himself At Christmas, in weakness and grace, the throne room of God is not the throne room of judgment. It says, therefore, let us approach the throne of grace. Rather than like, okay, you go first. No, you go first. You go in the throne. I'm not going in the throne room. You know what I'm saying? That's the way the Old Testament folks were. I'm not getting myself killed. You get yourself killed. I'm not going there, you go. That's the way the Old Testament shows the story. New Testament, the throne room of grace. The God who is there has identified with the low to say, I'll accept you just as you are. Come on in. The door's open. The coffee's on. The sofa's ready. Step on in. You can enter the throne of grace with boldness. And not only is God going to accept you when you come in the room, guess what he's going to do? He's going to help you. You can receive mercy and grace in your moment of need. Are you in need today? You say, oh, no, no, I'm not in need. Excuse me. Have you not heard anything about weakness? The old gospel hymn, I need you every hour. That's where we live. Quite frankly, why don't you just live in the throne room? Just say, God, I need you. I need you. I need you. But you know what that means? Every moment you got to say, God, I'm weak. I'm needy. 
but you've met me here. And I'm not going to deny this. I'm going to accept this. And God, I'm going to, I'm going to express my weakness. And, and guess what? God says, well, in that, I'm going to make you strong. You say, Rusty, I don't have anything for God. I'm spiritually bankrupt. If you knew what I did, you'd, your, your hair would stand on end. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cashed out. I'm bankrupt. You know what Jesus said? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the message of Christmas. God has stooped low to meet you where you are, to bring down the haughty, and to raise up the lowly. This is our God. Don't gaze at the nativity and think, oh yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's it's commonplace. Mm -mm. It reveals to us a God who is there. And there's no way we'd have thought this unless God said, here I am. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, there's an opportunity at the end of this message to say, God, I need you. You can, you can come right to this front. You can see me after the service. You can leave today and know you're a Christian. What about it, Christian? If Jesus identified with us in our weakness, you know what we ought to probably do? Be willing to identify with other people in their weakness. You thought about that? You know, it's interesting. Why does everybody become a philanthropist in December? You thought about this? You know, everybody there a philanthropist. From December 1 to about December 25th, everybody's a philanthropist. Oh, we're going to go to the soup kitchens. Oh, we're going to buy presents. Oh, we're going to do... What in the world? Why does everybody turn into a philanthropist? I talk to these same people in March, and they're not philanthropists. You know, they're downright stingy, some of them. Like, what in the world happened to you people? You know what actually happened? You've been influenced by the example of Jesus, and you don't even know it. The God who has been identified with the weak... You realize, well, if I'm going to celebrate Christmas, you know, Jesus is going to identify with the weak. I guess I got to go identify with the weak at least through December. This is not. The message of Christmas is true all year long. Do you know this? All year long. The God to the lowly. At Christmas is the God to the lowly all year long. Do you know this? But boy, that should challenge us. It should challenge us. Challenge me. That this, the God who has stooped low, requires his disciples to walk as he walked. May we do it not just at Christmas, but every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who has come to us. God, if we think we're too broken, we're too lowly, we're too messed up. God says, not only have I come to where you are, I'm identifying with you right there in your weakness. God, let no person in this room, no person watching think, God has not come for me, for he has precisely come for the ones who think that they have not been come for. And God, may we be a community who doesn't push off to somebody else to do the hard work we need to do. As Jesus took on flesh and met people, God, may we in our flesh meet people, identify with them right where they are, and then as Jesus did, reveal to them the way out. God, may this familiar story never lose its freshness. May we be moved by it this Christmas, as every Christmas. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.
God made the familiar story of Christmas. The God who had to stoop so low remind us where we are. All that we are, all that we will ever be is because of the instrument of the grace of God. And God, we're thankful that you met us at our lowest 
so that you could raise us to the highest. And God, may that truth of that song, our need for you, be real this Christmas. God, may we experience you in all of your fullness, in all of your grace, in all of your mercy. And God, we're thankful that we can come to you right now knowing that you're right here with us, waiting to meet us in our moment of need with grace and mercy. Our hearts cry, thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.